<laughs> Done. Through hike complete. Time to talk about gear. Let's do it. Right, exactly six months, 180 days, 2,200 miles, four pairs of trail runners, and Appalachian Trail, check, done. Now I'm back in Hawaii. Time to talk about my gear, what worked, what didn't, and I'm gonna start with my backpack. I started the trail with my Superior Wilderness Designs Long Haul. It's a 50 liter back with 10 liters of external storage. If you haven't seen it yet, check out my YouTube review. It's on my channel. Grizzle Gear, I do a pretty extensive review on this pack and very soon I'm going to be doing a follow-up review and I'm going to dive a little deeper into what I liked and what I didn't like about this pack. But let me tell you something, there is not much that I did not like about this pack. This thing was so comfortable because my loads never really reach over 30 pounds and that includes in the 100 mile wilderness with like six days of food. Um, I went really light this year. so. I ended up removing the aluminum stays in this pack. I didn't even use them. Um, that dropped the weight of the pack itself significantly. I haven't weighed the stays, but um, it lightened my load even a little more, and I didn't even notice that they weren't there. That's how comfortable and how well this pack rides. Um, also, I didn't sustain very much wear on this pack, um, especially considering I had maybe two or 300 miles on this pack before I even started the trail. So this thing now has 2,500 miles on it. Let's take a look at how it's worn. Okay, this pack fared very well considering it has 2,500 miles on it. As you can see, the mesh areas um, definitely sustain some holes. Um, this pocket got a little hole in it and some tears. Other than that, as you can see, I mean, the pack... There's no tears in any of that X-Pack material. Nothing, no tears whatsoever. There's a little discoloration, obviously. I did end up losing one of the pockets on this pack. I started out with two black pockets. As you can see, I now have a white pocket. The white pockets are actually the pockets that came with this pack. The black pocket is from a Superior Wilderness Designs 35 liter pack that I also have. And I decided to bring this pocket because I thought the black looked better than the white. Well, what happened was one of the loops uh, that attached the pocket to the pack ended up tearing the seams tour, which isn't surprising considering I probably had 1200 miles on that pocket before I even started this through hike. So that's easily fixed with white pockets. Um, the other thing that I have to point out about this pack is I have, it has lost like all its waterproof capability. Well, it did lose all its waterproof capability. It's kind of my fault. The, um, the pack started stinking pretty bad because you know, when you're a through hiker, you stink. So my pack smelled horrible. It was absolutely atrocious. And since I wasn't using the aluminum stays, I decided to turn the pack inside out and stick it in a washing machine. And I ended up doing that probably four or five times along the trail. My pack looked a lot cleaner than everyone else's pack, smelled a lot cleaner. And since I lined my pack with a trash compactor bag, I didn't worry too much about it not being waterproof. Now that I'm home, I actually sprayed this pack down with DWR and I guess I replenished the DWR coating on it, and now when it rains, the water just beads right off it. So I'm not concerned about that. Other than that, man, I mean, everything I just pointed out to you, this backpack's cherry. I'm pretty sure this could get me through another through hike. So one of the pieces of gear that I've gotten a lot of questions uh, about on the trail and off of the trail is my water bottle holder uh, that attaches to the pack. This did not come with the pack. This is made by Justin Anderson and he sells them on a couple Facebook groups, but it's a smart water bottle holder and he makes two sizes. He makes a 700 milliliter size and a 1000 milliliter size for the full size smart water bottles. I actually went through two of these. Well, I went through one of them on the trail. It lasted me about 1800 miles before it got some holes in it and Justin saw them on the vlog and said, hey man, looks like you got some holes in your carrier and he sent me a new one. 
So this thing has held up great. It's, it went through all of Southern Maine, through the Mahusik Notch, all that stuff, and all the rugged areas of New Hampshire and Maine. And the thing held up great. I mean, it looks like brand new still. I'm gonna be shooting a review on this very soon, probably in the next week. I'll show you guys how this water bottle holder attaches. I'll, I'll get a little more in depth as far as the weights and stuff go. But this backpack, I definitely recommend Superior Wilderness Designs packs. And I noticed that they're starting to occasionally make DCF packs, packs out of Cuban, which really interests me. That means these things will get even lighter. I wasn't sure about the X-Pack material when I started this hike, but I'll tell you what, I am a fan now. That stuff is really durable, it's water repellent, and uh, it holds up great. Let's move on to the tent. Gotta set it up real quick. All right, so I started the trail with the Z-Packs Altiplex, which initially I really liked. The thing was lightweight. It was, a, I had a ton of room in it, and uh, it was bomb proof in the wind. 50, 60 mile an hour winds, that tent handled it no problem. Um, problem is, is I kept getting water inside the tent. When it rained, I would get puddles inside the tent. And for the life of me, I could not figure out why. I troubleshooted like everything on the tent. I looked for pinholes in the bathtub floor all kinds of stuff. What I ended up discovering was at the top of the tent where the pole inserted, um, the Cuban fiber itself, the DCF, was actually delaminating. So I contacted ZPAX about it and they told me they're actually discontinuing the Altiplex and they apologized immensely and told me they were going to replace my tent with a brand new Plexamid which is the newest tent that they make. The thing comes in at 14.8 ounces. If you have not already seen my, my review on this on the Grizzle Gear channel, definitely check it out. I go pretty in depth. I'm gonna be doing a follow-up review on this in the next two to three weeks, and uh, I'll get really into it. But I had absolutely no complaints with this tent. Like I said, it weighs 14.8 ounces. This thing performed flawlessly. Um, the water, the way it's designed, any condensation on the walls of the tent actually run down the tent and go right out the screen door. And the other thing I like is this adjusting system where you can actually pull your bathtub floor up on this tent. But this thing is solid, man. It's absolutely solid. It's bomb proof. No complaints. Actually, there's one thing you have to keep in mind with this tent is if you're setting up in the rain or you're expecting inclement weather, you want the back of the tent, you want this, the wind to come this way into your tent. You want the back of your tent facing the wind where the wind and the rain is gonna come. And the reason for that is I had a couple occasions where um, it got really windy and what was happening was the water that was running down the tent here the wind would catch it. The wind would blow on this flap. And what would happen is, I would get water droplets on the screen here. And there were several times where even though this bathtub floor is eight inches, the wind was coming underneath here so much that I ended up with a puddle in that corner of the tent. So that's one thing to keep in mind with this. And it's really minor. I mean, it's a minor thing to have to think about. You get used to it pretty quickly, but 14.8 ounces, I have no complaints on my tent. So let's check out my quilt now. All right, I started the trail with an Enlightened Equipment Revelation, a 20 degree quilt. Uh, this thing is great in cold weather, and even when the temps start to get up into the 40s and 50s, it still work great um, because you have the ability to open this quilt up entirely. Um, as you can see, I have a 10D forest green, I believe, on the inside. And I opted for a thicker, a little more durable 20D on the outside. This thing is a little more water repellent. And I opted to go with that because I do have a single wall tent that is prone to condensation. So I figured I wanted something with a little more water repellency just in case my quilt, you know, rubbed up against the inside of the tent. Okay, so how this thing works is you have a zipper at the foot box. And the first thing you want to do is go ahead and zip that up. There we go. Once you get that zipped up, you have a couple little uh, pull cords here, little toggles, and all you do to close up your foot box 
Let's scrunch these guys up. There's my other one, there it is. Only takes a second. And then right before you scrunch everything up, you wanna take, one, take your snaps, put your snaps together here, and then finish them. And that completely closes up the hole so no air can get in. Then as you run up the quilt, you have several snaps. These snap together, let me zip that up all the way. And there, I have a fully formed foot box now. And see, very, very easy. Now you have clips here on the quilt. And you come, it comes with a couple straps and the straps fit around your mattress pad and then these clips clip to them. Now the whole idea behind a quilt is that when you're using a down sleeping bag, you are laying on top of the down. Uh, and you cr compress the down so it loses all its insulation quality when it's compressed like that So with a quilt It's it straps to your pad and you're actually laying on top of your pad So by doing that you're not wasting any material or wasting any down and you end up with a much lighter product So this quilt performed very well on the trail. I only ended up using it until I believe southern Virginia or so because the temperatures started warming up summer was coming and this thing it was just getting way too warm for a, a 20 degree quilt so I didn't have a whole lot of money to spend because I hadn't planned out my summer quilt situation poor planning on my part but what I ended up doing was I split a pack of Costco 700 fill down quilts I split a pack of two with Birdman and I think it was 50 bucks for the pack. So we paid 25 bucks a piece. Let me show you this quilt real quick. This is my $25 Costco down quilt. It measures 60 inches by 70 inches. And it's down to, it's good down to, I'd probably say about 50 degrees. It doesn't snap up, it doesn't zip up. It's just a throw blanket. But this thing got me through a very, very large tr chunk of the trail. No complaints on this quilt none whatsoever it's lightweight uh, you do want to keep it dry because the down is not dwr treated like the enlightened equipment quilt was but uh this is a solid quilt if you are looking for a very very inexpensive summer quilt for the trail look for the costco i believe it's called the double black diamond down quilt look for it on costco.com or just go into your local one maybe they stock it who knows but that's my quilt system. Now what I did was I used a Thermarest NeoAir X-Lite for the entire trail. Now that mattress pad I actually got when I did the second half of the Appalachian Trail in 2016. I also used it for 650 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail and then about five or 600 miles into the hike on the AT this year. Uh, my mattress pad started leaking. I could not figure out where. I mean, I took, I took it out in lakes, I took it out in bathtubs, I put it in swimming pools, I sprayed it down with dish soap. I could not find a leak anywhere. All I know is I would go to sleep at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and I would wake up at 4 in the morning with my butt touching the ground. I wasn't a big fan. I contacted Thermarest. They said the only possible way that they could take care of it is if I mail it into them so they can assess it. They would not send me a new pad until I sent the old pad in. So... I pretty much just dealt with it <laughs> the entire trail man um, I normally wake up at like 5 in the morning when I'm on the trail so 4 4 30 I'd wake up with my hip on the ground it'd be so close to you know my wake up time I just dealt with it the entire trail now I do not have that pad right now to show to you because I mailed it in the Thermarest to either get repaired or they're probably just gonna send me a new one because a baffle ended up breaking in it too but a lot of people complain about the Thermarest NeoAir X-Lite being noisy. Um, there's a trade-off for that. You know, it has a high R value. I think it's right around 3.7 or so. So that crinkly noise you hear inside the mattress pad is actually what keeps you warm uh, when it's really cold outside. But over time and with use, that crinkling sound does diminish. It gets much less noticeable. Um, and I've always been of the mind that if you wake up in the middle of the night because your mattress pad is too loud, then you didn't walk far enough that day. <laughs>
If you guys have been following the channel for a while, then you probably already know what pillow I use. It is the Big Sky Dream Sleeper. It comes in at 1.6 ounces. It's got a really cool little thermo rest inflate valve. It takes four to five breaths to inflate. Let's see. There we go. And that is the pillow. Uh, if you want to see more about this thing, check out the review on it. I have no complaints on this pillow. I would slide, you know, my town shirt or my puffy over it every night when I went to sleep to give myself a little pillowcase. And uh, this pillow was great. In fact, my entire sleep system, man, both my quilts, my mattress pad, my pillow, no complaints whatsoever other than that leaky mattress pad. But if I had to do it all again, which I will be doing soon, I'm definitely going with another Neo Air X Lite. I love that pad, it's a good one. I started the trail off with an alcohol stove. It was one I made myself and I also fashioned like a caldera cone type thing to try to make it more efficient. Um, I liked the alcohol stove system for the first part of the trail, but when I hit the Smokies, we were encountering rain with like 50 mile an hour winds and uh, it just, I lost all efficiency with the stove. I found that by the time I was done boiling two cups of water, everyone else had already been done eating for like five minutes. So I got rained out in the Smokies and I ended up going into Gatlinburg. Yeah, it's where I saw the bear on the second floor of the hotel. If you haven't seen that episode, go back and check it out. But um, Smokey ended up deciding that he did not like his BRS 3000 canister stove. So he ended up selling that to me for like eight bucks or 10 bucks or something. And I think he got a pocket rocket too, which he ended up liking. Um, I bought the BRS off of him and transitioned to the canister stove because I had some experience with the BRS 3000 when I was on the PCT. And while it isn't the most efficient canister stove out there, the thing only weighs 26 grams and it's freaking, it's really ultra light. I tried to carry the smaller canisters more often than the, the bigger canisters of fuel. And the reason for that is the smaller canisters fit in my pot really well. The pot I used is the same one I started out with. I actually have probably about 3,500 miles on this thing so far. This is a Tokes Titanium 700 milliliter pot. I think it costs around 30 bucks or so, but the thing weighs 3.2 ounces and a small canister of fuel fits inside it. No problem. Um, the spoon I used, on um, the PCT, I think I used an, an Optimus titanium spoon. This is a Sea to Summit anodized spoon, and I believe it's even lighter than the titanium one. So that's that. Now for my water filtration, I used a Sawyer Squeeze for the entire through height. Um, before I left, I was really on the fence as to whether I was going to bring a Sawyer Squeeze or a Katadin B-Free. I used the Bee Free for like the 650 mile section of the PCT I did last year. And uh, I went through two Bee Frees in that 650 mile section. Um, the problem with the Bee Free, I think, is it's only good for like a thousand gallons as opposed to, you know, a hundred thousand or whatever that the, the Sawyer's good for. And it, once it gets a good clog, it's really hard to unclog it by just swishing it in water. It, it's tough to get the sediment out. So, while the, the flow of the Bee Free is way better than the flow of the Sawyer, the longevity concerned me. So I ended up going with the Sawyer this time, and it, one Sawyer squeeze, the full-size squeeze, lasted me the entire through hike. I went through several of the Sawyer bags, um, probably like four or five Sawyer bags for the entire trip, because, you know, after a while those things break. But I didn't, I never bought one Sawyer bag. All the Sawyer bags I used, I found in hiker boxes along the way and they were brand new because someone would buy a pack of three, decide, oh, I only need to carry one of these or I need to carry two of these. I don't want the extra weight. So they would throw the brand new bags in hiker boxes and voila, I get new Sawyer bags for free. Anyway, um, I know a lot of people actually would just screw their filter, uh, their Sawyer right onto a smart water bottle and either drink from that or squeeze out of that into another bottle. The whole squeezing the Sawyer bottle over and over again is just old for me, man. It, it's a pain once you squeeze all the air out and the water wants to come out and it's just a big pain in the butt. So 
I stuck with the bags the whole way. Overall, I was really happy with my pot, my spoon, my water filter system. Um, the only thing I had an issue with was that alcohol stove. I have been a fan of alcohol stoves in the past, but like I said, man, it just, the Smokies and bad weather, it's just, it's a no-go with alcohol stoves, man. You're way better off with a canister stove. At least that's my opinion. Uh, let's start to look at some of the clothing that I took with me on the trail. All right, I started the trail with a very inexpensive puffy. It was a 32 degrees, uh, I think 700 fill power down puffy. I paid maybe 30 bucks for it. There was a sale online. 32 degrees was the name of the brand. The jacket was great. Um, unless you're trying to go super, super ultralight, like I don't know why you would spend a whole lot of money on a puffy. It just did. The thing is going to stink, it's going to get beat up, it's um, it's probably going to get holes in it and stuff. That 32 degrees uh, down jacket lasted me until New Hampshire, Rattle River in New Hampshire. And what ended up happening was uh, it was a little chilly out and I was outside and I went inside and I went to put a pizza in the oven and uh, I burnt a massive hole in my freaking jacket. So I ended up at Walmart. And uh, it was really the only option and the, the last Walmart on the trail, the last place for me to buy any type of jacket. And I picked up this um, synthetic puffy here. And this thing, it's, it's heavy. The thing probably weighs like a little bit under a pound. But um, it was all they had at the time. It served its purpose. It kept me warm. I'm probably not going to use this thing again. I may end up donating it to someone because it is a little too heavy for, you know, for what I want um, but uh, it served me well and that 32 degrees down jacket would have lasted me the entire trail if I wasn't dumb <laughs> and if I didn't burn a big hole in the sleeve um, while we're talking about jackets let me get on to my rain gear I started the trail with a Berghaus Vaporlite Hyper Smock uh, it was one of my favorite pieces of gear the thing weighed 3.2 ounces one of the lightest fully waterproof raincoats in the world and uh, the only problem is, is I, it was probably three years old or four years old. So when I hit the Smokies and all that rough rain, the jacket was soaking through and it was cold out too. It was probably in the fifties or so. So it, it just wasn't working for me, man. So I ended up hiker boxing that jacket. I also started the trail with this. This is a 3F UL rain kilt. It's made of sil nylon. My initial intention when I got this was to serve for it to serve a dual purpose. It would not only be a rain kill, but I could wear it when I did all my laundry and that way my junk wasn't showing. Well, that plan didn't work out very well because this stuff, this material is almost translucent. Uh, so laundry kilt didn't work, but as far as a rain kilt, this thing kicked butt. Uh, I'll probably be doing a review on all this gear and you know, I'll get a little more into it, but this rain kilt, man, 3FUL, I think it was eight bucks for this thing. I ordered it off of eBay. It took three weeks, it got here from China, but it worked great, woo! All right, raincoat. Um, that Berghaus, I got rid of it, but I picked up this. Um, what happened was in Gatlinburg, Silver Bullet actually had a Frog Togs, and she was getting rid of that Frog Togs jacket and I think she bought a Patagonia she ended up being really happy with. But um, she gave me her Frog Togs. I rocked that for a couple weeks. But the Frog Togs jacket and really torrential downpours, it would actually wet through. So I said, you know what, I'm just gonna spend money and I'm gonna get a new raincoat. I did not wanna get another Berghouse because I didn't have $300 to drop on a raincoat. So I spent a hundred bucks on this Montane Minimus. It has like Pertex shield, I guess. Um, it's supposed to be really breathable. There are no pit zips. Um, if I had to do it again, I would not buy this coat because yes, it is a sweat box. There are no pit zips. Um, it's, it was supposedly really breathable, but when they say something's breathable, if air can get through it, water can probably get through it too. So same thing with this. I mean, this thing worked great the first couple times I used it. Um, the water would just beat up and roll right off of it. But, you know, after four uses, maybe five uses, it would soak through. This entire inside gray area would turn a very, very dark gray and it would be wet to the touch. 
if I were to touch it on a piece of paper, it would make the paper wet. So I wrote Montaigne about it and I said, hey man, this jacket's soaking through. Like, what's up with this thing? And they said, it's impossible for water to get through. Meanwhile, if this is wet and I touch it to a piece of paper, the inside of the jacket, it gets the paper wet. I don't think there's too much left now, is there? I got a little bit more clothing and uh, electronics. I think that's it. Um, as far as clothing, I'm, like I said, I've never spent much money on clothing because it's going to stink. I mean, you're showering once a week, once every two weeks. Every day you're sweating. Um, it doesn't matter if you spent $50 on a Patagonia shirt or if you spent $5 on a synthetic athletics brand shirt. It's all going to stink. <laughs> so my recommendation when it comes to clothing is just find something lightweight that dries quickly that's comfortable. For me, I ended up rocking a pair of Columbia shorts. They're lightweight. They dry really quickly. I used these shorts for the entire through hike. Uh, they ended up with one little burn hole in it. I guess I got too close to a fire. But um, I wore these and I also wore ex officio boxers because they don't ride all up in your butt crack and they're really comfortable. Um, as far as a shirt, I think I used like an athletics brand synthetic shirt from Target or something. And uh, actually I went through a couple shirts. I went through maybe three shirts on the way. Um, I picked one up at a thrift store at one point. Um, that's the thing, you're going to hit plenty of places along the way to just pick up more clothing if you want, you know. If you find that, you know, it's too cold at night and you don't have enough gear, you know, you stop at a thrift store, you go into a Walmart, a Target or something along the way. The AT isn't really as remote as, I guess, people make it out to be. I mean, if you average 15 miles a day, maybe a little more, 15 to 18 miles a day, Really, there's a town like every three days on the AT, maybe every four days at the most, with the exception of the 100 mile wilderness. It's very easy to just hop off and buy stuff if you need it. You're not stuck with what you bring out there. Um, now with socks, socks. I use the same system the whole way. It's my tried and true foot shoe system. I rocked uh, in gingy toe liners with darn tough socks and uh, ultra lone peaks with super feet trailblazer insoles. And I got maybe two blisters in 2,200 miles. I mean, that's that's my my footproof plan for for feet. <laughs> that makes no sense. Yeah, it's what works for me, man. So I definitely recommend checking out some sock liners. It'll help cut down on the blisters and the friction between your toes and on your heels. Um, oh, so I went through four pairs of Ultra Loom Peaks on the entire trail. Uh, I got 700 miles out of one pair. Actually. The pair I ended the trail with, I had several hundred miles on, and I'm still rocking those things and hikes around here, around my house here in Hawaii. So, um, all right, I think my clothing is pretty much done. Am I missing anything here? Oh, yes, I am. It's this, my damn beanie. I love this thing, man. It weighs one ounce. It's got 850 fill power, down tech treated down in it. It's got a really nice band on the inside that's comfortable on the ears. This thing is a winner. I have no complaints on this hat. Uh, this hat was actually made by a guy named Mark Anderson. He sells these in several of the Facebook groups online. Uh, I think he sells them in my Grizzle Gear group too. My Grizzle Gear group is a, uh, it's a Facebook buy and sell used gear group. And uh, it's a great place to go for backpacking advice too. So if you're not a member of that, check it out. Facebook group, Grizzle Gear. I started the trail off with the Samsung Galaxy S Active uh, as my phone. And I like this phone a lot. It took really good pictures, great vid video. And, um, but I ended up dropping the thing. I dropped it and can you see the pink lines on the screen there? It got really annoying. It was hard to read stuff on the screen. It was hard to do a lot of stuff on the phone so I decided to order a new phone and I picked up an HTC One M9. Actually I didn't bring it out with me. That's okay. I don't want to show you that phone anyway because it's a piece of junk. It's good as a phone and that's pretty much it. The camera was useless on it. It had no HDR, nothing. So I ended up using the HTC as my basic phone and I kept the S7 Active and uh, ended up using this as a camera and I kept shooting time lapses and stuff with it so did a bunch with this phone it's a good phone um, now my camera I shot with uh, all the vlog stuff 
the gear, a lot of the gear reviews. All was this Sony FDR X3000 camera. I did a quick review on this in my Q&A section. I'm gonna do a more in-depth one eventually. But um, this camera shoots in 4K. I generally shot in 1080p just because it's a lot easier to deal with the file sizes, uploading and transferring and all that stuff. 4K it just produces these massive video files that are just, it, it's too much to deal with out in the field. Now to keep everything powered, I uh, came out here initially with an Anchor Power Core 13,400 mAh power bank. And um, this thing I've had for a couple years. I've had this since I did the second half of the AT back in 2016. And it doesn't quite hold the charge that it used to, but I found it to be for the most part sufficient because I only brought one backup battery for this Sony camera. And uh, I don't know, as the hike went on and I started shooting more and more footage all the time, I started tearing through the battery on the Sony uh, quicker and quicker. So I found that this wasn't sufficient. It wasn't quite cutting it. So I picked up an Anchor PowerCore 10,000 mAh. This thing's really light. It charges fast. Uh, it's got that, that IQ charging, whatever. So I ended up carrying both of these things, which gave me, what, 23,400 mAh, which is an insane amount of battery, but I never, ever had to worry about running out. I could listen to podcasts all day long while I hiked. Um, it was nice to have all that and you know my pack was never over what it averaged I think 24 pounds or so and that's even with all this extra weight eh. as far as electronics oh you know what I, I uh, tripod I started with like a foam wire cheapo little like three four dollar tripod that thing lasted two days I tried to wrap it around a bridge to get a shot and the wire snapped and a leg fell out and that was it it was junk so i ended up picking up like a cheapo 18 dollar gorilla pod wannabe walmart tripod which is what i'm actually using right now um but this is what it looks like and uh i can't really recommend this tripod it's heavy it's bulky um it doesn't grip quite as well as the uh the gorilla tripods do um, but you know, it got me by and it worked, but if I had to do it again, I would not get this thing. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I left with an anchor quick charger, which I really liked, but I left it at Four Pines Hostel and I never got it back, unfortunately. So I ended up picking up another 2.4 milliamp double USB quick charge thing and uh, that's all I really brought. I brought that and two of these little wires and that covered all my electronic stuff except for my headlamp. Headlamp. I started the trail with a Black Diamond Iota, a really lightweight rechargeable headlamp. It didn't have a whole lot of lumens. It wasn't the brightest headlamp but I really dug it and I was used to the controls. I was used to how it worked. The problem is is the hinge on the light itself ended up snapping uh, and it happened at trail days the funny thing is is the day after my headlamp broke and snapped off the hinge I entered a hot dog eating contest at trail days you can see it it's one in, in one of the videos on the vlog but uh I ended up I placed third I got third place and I got a $50 gift certificate to the local outfitter and uh, I picked up this Petzl Actic I think it's 250 lumens it's extremely bright. It's a really bright headlamp. Um, whoa, there goes my food bag. <laughs> it's a really bright headlamp. The problem with this headlamp is you can't dim it at all. The strap always comes undone on my head, and I'm just not a big fan of the whole Petzl. You have to click it once to get one setting, click it twice to get another, click it three times to get another, hold it in to get a red light. It's just a pain in the butt to use. So. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be using this on my next long distance hike. I might go back to a black diamond. I just like the, the ability to dim your headlamp, you know, and the, the red light, the red LED on this headlamp is like useless. It doesn't brighten up anything. It's absolutely useless. So this thing, meh, get rid of it. Now that food bag that just blew by, I almost blew away. 
Loomis didn't talk about this. This is my z -Packs food bag. Uh, every night I would hang my bag in a tree to keep it away from squirrels, chipmunks, and bears. And uh, this is the bag I used. It's a uh, DCF Cuban fiber. And I saw several people with this bag on the trail. Some of them had the luck I did. And it ended up like this at the end of the through hike. No holes, no punctures, no Cuban fraying. Um, in excellent condition, even the Velcro still works. It works great. But there are some people I saw with massive holes in their you know in their z-packs food bags and stuff like that so I, maybe it's hit or miss with these things but my experience with this bag i really enjoyed it i mean it worked not enjoyed it <laughs> i really liked it it worked good um i also used the z-pack slick line bear line that stuff was great i didn't get it snagged once it lasted lasted me the entire trail all 2200 miles didn't get stuck in one tree all my throws were perfect. It was great. Let me think, what else? What other gear did I bring? I think that's everything. Uh, oh, trekking poles. That's the last thing. I started with, I don't even remember what poles I started with, but I just know they were from Amazon. They were probably 30 bucks. They were really inexpensive. And they broke. Uh, by hot springs, they had bent in like 90 degree angle. So I ended up picking up a pair of Lecky, uh, Lakey Journey poles. They were they were a little more expensive. I think I spent like 80 bucks on them. Um, one of them bent. Uh, Lecky sent me a replacement for it. And they ended up getting me to the end of the trail. But one of my poles was like half Lecky, half Black Diamond because that bent too. So when I was done with the trail, I just said, you know what, I'm done with these poles. I, it would have cost me 25 bucks extra because I would have had to check my backpack if I had the poles in there. So I decided to just use my backpack as a carry-on. I ditched the poles. They were all kind of pieced together anyway. And uh, now I'm rocking like a really inexpensive set of like outdoor products poles that I had just kind of sitting around the house. So um, I think that's pretty much all my gear. I may have missed some stuff. If I did and if you notice me missing anything, just leave leave a comment below and uh, maybe I'll do a, a follow-up to my follow-up. Um, what am I doing in the future? A lot of people have asked me, am I doing the PCT next year? Am I going to do the CDT? What am I doing? Well, as many of you know, last year I did 650 of the PCT. I did like the whole desert section. Um, this upcoming summer, I am not going to be doing the PCT or the CDT. Um, as you know, I live in Hawaii. I live on the island of Kauai, and uh, I've done a lot of hiking on this island. I still haven't seen everything here, but I haven't really done any hiking on Oahu or Maui or on the Big Island. So next summer, I am going to try to do a weekly hike if I can afford it, and uh, I'm going to do a bunch of island hopping, and I'm going to vlog all the hikes that I do here in Hawaii. And uh, hopefully that can keep you guys entertained. And then the following summer, most likely 2020, I will be doing an entire through hike of the Pacific Crest Trail. Who knows with me, man? Stuff is changing day to day. I might wake up tomorrow and be like, I'm going hiking here or I'm going there. I just got to go get out of here. You know, that's how it is with me. Um, I'm really fortunate, super blessed to live in Hawaii where I do and to be able to, you know, work six months a year and adventure six months a year so um yeah that's that's the future that's what the future holds for grizz and uh i'm going to continue to do reviews i got a whole bunch of reviews queued up over the next couple weeks there's probably going to be five to ten coming out so make sure you guys stay tuned for that hopefully this video hasn't been too long i, I once again i want to thank everyone who helped me out on my through hike man whether I hiked with you and you gave me a granola bar when I needed it or if you sent me a drop box or if you sent me cash or anything you did to help me out man I really appreciate it um, all you subscribers that sent me drop boxes and sent me food you guys are absolutely amazing and all you people who just subscribe in general and you know like the content that I'm putting out I really appreciate you you guys rock and uh, Again, thanks for tuning into this video, and uh, mahalo. Grizz is out.